Welcome to How to Talk to Kids About Anything with Dr. Robin Silverman, a podcast loaded with practical tips, powerful scripts, personal stories, and simple steps to make even the toughest conversations easier. So get ready to get the information you need to make the impact you want from someone you trust, your friend, parenting expert, Dr. Robin Silverman. Hello and welcome to How to Talk to Kids About Anything, where we give you the tips, scripts, stories, and steps to make even the toughest conversations easier. I'm so honored to be your host, Dr. Robin Silverman, child and teen development specialist, author and speaker, and most importantly, a parent of two great kids who give me the opportunity to love, learn, and grow every single day, whether I want to or not. Believe me, I get it. It's not always easy, but we're in this together and we have some great people helping us along the way. Now, in the wake of the very public emergence of the Me Too at Time's Up and now Girls Too movements, the latter that we talked about with the Girls Inc. team, Lara Kaufman and Dr. Christina Spears a few weeks back, women and girls have been encouraged to now find their voice, claim their power, come out of the shadows and not back down. But with a history of messages that tell girls and women that they need to be perfect, they shouldn't break the rules, they should be nice, they should be quiet, they should look pretty, take a back seat and downplay their own success to avoid making others feel uncomfortable or be seen as full of themselves, we wouldn't want that. It's a challenge for many to reinvent what it really means to be a woman in 2019. It takes mental strength. We must build mental muscle to get out of our own way if we're going to change along with these important empowerment movements. So how does mental strength in women make a difference? What areas specifically should we be working on? And how does embracing and practicing mental strength as women translate to encouraging mental strength in the girls we love, teach, and guide? For these questions and more, we'll be interviewing the fabulous Amy Morin for the third time in the history of our show. Now, Amy Morin is a licensed clinical social worker, college psychology instructor, and psychotherapist. She is the author of the bestseller, great book, 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do, as well as 13 Things Mentally Strong Parents Don't Do. We interviewed her on both of those books previously. Amy serves as Very Well's parenting teens expert and child discipline expert and is a regular contributor to Forbes Inc. and Psychology Today. She's the only person in the psychology industry who's taking on the mental strength idea and talking about mental strength on a global level. She was named the self-help guru of the moment by The Guardian. She lives in Marathon, Florida, and she has a new book coming out I'm so excited about, 13 Things Mentally Strong Women Don't Do. I know you're going to love it. I'm always excited to have Amy Morin on the show. So welcome, Amy. Third time's a charm to how to talk to kids about anything. Absolutely. Thanks for having me back again. I'm glad to have you back. I think your information is so important and relevant. And before we get into the meat of the matter, for those who haven't yet gotten their hands on your newly released book, 13 Things Mentally Strong Women Don't Do, tell us what it means to have mental strength and what inspired you to write this book about women right now. Well, there's three parts to mental strength. It's the way you think, feel, and behave. So when it comes to thoughts, it's about knowing how to think realistically rather than exaggerating your uh, the negative or dwelling on things that aren't helpful. It's about knowing how to make your thoughts productive. The second part is the emotional part, which is about knowing that you can cope with uncomfortable feelings, but also that you have the power to change your emotions when you're feeling down, you can cheer yourself up. When you're angry, you can calm yourself down. And finally, it's about knowing how to take positive action. So even when you're in a situation that's really rough or you're encountering things that are painful and difficult, what can you do to make your life or somebody else's life at least a little bit better? And after I wrote my first book, I had a lot of questions from people about Uh, raising mentally strong kids, which is where the second book, the parenting book came from. But after I wrote that book, I had so many questions from uh, parents, especially moms, about raising mentally strong daughters and being mentally strong women in today's world. And I think we have so many role models of, of what we think mental toughness should be. But usually it's a Navy SEAL who is really muscular and somebody that can put their body through all sorts of physical pain. 
But then women just didn't have a lot of examples. How do you still be nurturing and caring and loving and how can you be feminine and yet strong at the same time? Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to write this book as a way to show women what does it mean to be a mentally strong woman? How do you raise mentally strong daughters? And then how do you raise men also to be aware of some of the challenges that women face? Mm -hmm. And in researching and writing this book, I really wanted to make it clear that there are a lot of cultural influences. There are a lot of uh, things that women face that men don't. A lot of it's subtle. A lot of it goes back to the way we treat girls during childhood. And it influences us as women as we're growing up, how we see ourselves, how we view our potential. And so I really wanted to write this book to spread more awareness, break down barriers, and help women become the strongest and best versions of themselves. Mm, I love that answer. And I, I like that you're referring to a variety of different age groups that yes, you know, this is about what mentally strong women don't do, but this starts early on. I know in your book, you have 13 different areas that women should focus on so that they can become mentally strong and, and avoid sabotaging themselves in each particular area. So can you tell us what are a few takeaways that women at different stages of their lives, whether they're teens or they're adults in the workplace or they're mothers, what they should keep in mind as they are building mental strength? Sure. I guess, you know, it's important to note first, everybody always wants to know, why would you write a book about what not to do? And it's because I think for women, there's so many of these habits that we are more likely to engage in, partly just because of the way we've been socialized. And mm -hmm. so while men may uh, be prey to these 13 things, there's a reason that women are especially more likely to engage in them. And uh, to pick just a couple of them, I would say one is that mentally strong women don't fear breaking the rules. Mm -hmm. And there are so many rules that us as women tend to follow. And you mentioned some of them in your introduction. They're the unofficial rules, like women are supposed to be polite and they're supposed to smile and be kind <laughs> and, and not be angry. And uh, we give uh, boys a lot of uh, freedom and they're Research will show this, especially in America, that teachers, coaches, parents give boys a little bit more of a free pass when it comes to breaking the rules. Mm. We have this mentality that boys will be boys and they can misbehave, but that girls shouldn't and that girls should be polite and quiet and well-mannered. Mm. And because of that, we're, we're raising girls to, to follow a certain set of rules. And But we know that sometimes rule breakers are the ones who get out there and change the world. Mm -hmm. And even this study on sixth grade kids found that kids who break the rules in the sixth grade are more likely to become millionaires mm. later in life. Interesting. <laughs> Whether they're disruptors or they're entrepreneurs or innovators, whatever it is, that you know they can kind of look at things in a different way. Not that being rich is the, the epitome of success in life, but I think it's just interesting to note that when we are instilling these things in girls and they grow up to be women who think I, I always have to follow the rules and an example of how that can play out in adulthood is uh, when they when we look at job advertisements if a job advertisement says you need 15 years of experience men are likely to apply when they have about 12 years of experience because they think close enough <laughs> Women, on the other hand, think, well, if it says 15 years, that's the rule. That's what they're looking for. And they don't apply. Even if they have 13 or 14 years, mm. they think, I don't have 15, so I'm not going to go for it. That's just one simple example of how uh, how women, it's okay to sometimes break the rules, do things a little bit differently, look out, look outside of, of what you're doing and think, well, how could I do something different? Or what, what mm. would happen if I broke this rule, whether it's an official rule or more one of those unofficial stereotypes that we hold on to? Mm -hmm. So interesting. And, and I, uh, I, I agree that that is something that we hear about throughout our lives, you know, rules of, of what women are supposed to do, what girls are supposed to do. And we take these with us, uh, whether it is in school, or we take them with us when we are in college or in graduate school, or if we're you know, women in the in the workplace, uh, or in the family. Uh, so it, it can be challenging when you're taking these with you. There's other things that we also seem to take with us. We hear about sexism in the workplace. We hear about cyber sexism. We hear about cyber bullying. We hear about so many different things that we are now referring to more often now with Me Too and Time's Up. And it's easy to 
anticipate that many women and girls might not feel so mentally strong when faced with these types of situations, given that we're, we are embracing this Me Too and Time's Up uh, area of history. And I would love for you to talk about what mentally strong women won't do or don't do when facing these types of situations or even the potential of those kinds of dangers in everyday life. Sure. There's a whole chapter in my book about um, staying silent and the importance of not staying silent. And it's not to say that if you don't speak up that you're somehow weak. But it is important to know that harboring secrets, like when you, if you were harassed, you were abused, you were assaulted, that when you don't tell anybody, that that drains your mental strength when you feel like you have to keep it a secret and there's some level of shame there. And so, you know, it's always up to women to know when does it make sense to come forward? Do you tell your boss if your coworker is harassing you? Do you call the police if you are assaulted? That's a very individual decision to make. But I always encourage women to at least tell somebody, whether you have a friend, a nurse, a therapist, somebody that you can talk to so that you don't feel like you're so alone in this. And I think that's one of, been one of the greatest parts of the Me Too movement is for all of us just to realize it's not just me, mm -hmm. that um, so many of us have at least a few stories of times when um, we've been in situations that uh, where somebody abused their power or when somebody uh, said things that were inappropriate and it's embarrassing and we don't know what to do. And for so long, nobody was talking about it. And so I think for now to just be able to talk about it, whether you share with a friend, you uh, are willing to post something on social media, or you just open the door for other people to come talk to you. Mm -hmm. I had a friend who had put on social media, she said, uh, you know, gosh, I was dealing with sexual harassment at work. I didn't dare tell anybody. Um, but I just want you to know if that's ever happened to you, I'm open to conversations, no judgment about what you did if you dealt with it or you didn't tell anybody. Uh, but I just want you to know you're not alone. Mm. And she said she got all sorts of responses from some people that were just acquaintances, some people that were good friends, but they never discussed it. Mm -hmm. And it just opened the door to some conversations about it. Mm -hmm. So mentally strong women don't stay silent. And I would love to just challenge this for a moment because you opened your book with this great story about when you were a, a young student and your teacher was putting on some bonus questions around sports that had nothing to do with math, even though he was your math teacher. And when you took a makeup test and you got the baseball question right, because you were so into baseball, he assumed you had cheated because how could a girl have gotten this correct? And you told your father, your father took action, but what happened in the end was a big slap in the face from your teacher. The teacher said, oh, well, now I can't give bonus questions because some f parent thinks it's sexism. So what happens when you do open up just to challenge the situation and you get a response that isn't all that supportive? Unfortunately, we know that that happens a lot, right? That women will go to their boss and nothing changes at work mm -hmm. or and, you know, ultimately we get penalized for it, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think most of us have been in that situation where you try to tell somebody and somehow it backfires in the end. And so, again, I think it's about knowing uh, how, who can you still talk to? Mm -hmm. And if it didn't work out, whether you, you called the police and charges weren't pressed or you went to a supervisor or a colleague and it, and it didn't work out, to still know that it's okay to tell people mm -hmm. and maybe you just need to find your audience. Maybe you need to find a friend, a supportive person, somebody else that you can confide in who can say, I understand. It wasn't your fault. Uh, I've been there too. Uh, because I think just knowing that, that there are other people in a similar situation and it helps spread awareness. And unfortunately, it would be great if all of these things led to some kind of action. Unfortunately, we're not quite there yet mm -hmm. where it does. But uh, so, and you know, and again, I don't blame anybody who doesn't come forward and who decides I'm not going to go to the authorities or I'm not going to um, 
address this person directly. A lot of times it's not safe to confront somebody to their face. That's okay. You have to make the best decision you can in that moment. But I would just say don't stay silent uh, Mm -hmm. about it forever. Make sure you find somebody you can talk to. Yeah, I think what you're saying is really important. I just want to put high beams on this. It's not about telling somebody so that something might necessarily change, but that you feel supported, that you know that you're not alone, that somebody believes you. In your case, in this case that I was just talking about, it's your your father went to bat for you and said, that's not okay. And there must have been something that was very satisfying about that. And now with you telling the world about it, that other people are learning from this story that this is not the end, you know, that that when you talk about this, then you don't stay silent. Things maybe in the in the immediate world don't change or in that particular situation don't change. But your father probably regarded you as very strong for telling telling him. And also other people are probably benefiting now many years later. You know, I hope so. I think it's one of those stories of something that happened, you know, when I was in junior high. So it was 25 years ago at this point. But and at the time, again, a lot of us didn't think much of it. And I actually I'm still friends with a lot of the same people I was friends with in junior high. So interestingly, I've asked them now, do you remember that math teacher that used to do that? And a lot of my female friends are like, oh, I was so, I hated that math mm-hmm. class and I hated that he used to ask us bonus questions about sports. But again, we none of us liked it, but yet we, we tolerated mm-hmm. it. It was only because I was accused of cheating that we sort of went forward with this. But, um, but I think for a lot of us, it's given us insight into, okay, the world has changed. Yes. I don't think teachers would get away with nearly as no. much as... Now, as they did then, we still have a ways to go. And in the book, I talk about some ways that we are still giving boys unfair advantages. But I think sometimes it's just helpful to realize, okay, we've come a long way. Things have really changed and and we're making progress. And in talking about my story, it was a story that it's not – nothing that I really spent much time thinking about. And then when I went to write the book, I really started thinking about it. And I remember I actually just went to my dad the other day and said, hey, dad, do you remember that story? Because I put it in the book. And he said, oh, yeah. He said, I can't believe he used to do that. And it made an impact enough on my dad that he still remembers this story. But um, so I think just now just talking about stuff, even if it was something that happened 25 years ago, just knowing having somebody else say, gosh, that wasn't okay that Mm -hmm. that happened to you can can be quite healing. Mm, mm, yes, right, exactly. That it, there's not a, a time when you, it, oh, it's expired. Like there's no, you know, you shouldn't, it's not worth talking about even though you were six or 10 or 15. Like this is a great time to be sharing your stories and other people being able to really be there for you. Because as you said, it can be very healing. I, I have to say, when I was reading the story, I was getting infuriated. I, it really <laughs> struck a nerve in me. So I bet you it will in others. Um, I'd love to go specifically through your book. Your book is organized so beautifully. It's just so easy to take in and read. And I'd love to look at some of the areas of mental strength, of the things that mentally strong women don't do. Um, given that there are examples of women in our lives, uh, the examples that women have in our lives, they, they rub off on our girls. They state something very definitively to our boys and our men, not to mention how men regard women and their behaviors around challenging situations. So these mentally strong guidelines are really important. So you say that mentally strong women don't compare. And I mean, this is legendary, right? This comparison thing that we do. And I think it's tied in with the perfectionism that we feel like we we insist upon. But women, mentally strong women don't compare. So tell us about these comparisons and specifically what are helpful behaviors around comparisons and not such helpful behaviors around comparisons. Well, now that we live in this world of social media, of Mm. course, it's become so much easier than ever to compare ourselves. And I think for women, when you're scrolling through Facebook or you're looking on Instagram and you look at everybody else who looks happier, healthier, wealthier, they're more fit than you are, they seem to have it all together. It's easy to think, gosh, I'm not a good enough mom. I'm not a good enough partner. Mm -hmm. I don't work hard enough. I don't make enough money. And all of those sorts of things um, that just aren't healthy for us. And interestingly, 
We know, say, when women are scrolling through Instagram and they look at a beautiful woman, women are more likely to think, gosh, I could never be like that. Mm -hmm. Whereas when men, if they were scrolling through Instagram and they look at this sort of idyllic looking man, they're more likely to think, oh, I could be like that someday. Right. You said something about inspiration, right? That they get inspired from it. Yes. And how many women are like, wow, I look through all these, you know, fitness model <laughs> no. advertisements and I feel so inspired. Yeah, I don't no. think so. I think most of us start to feel really guilty. Like I need to work out. I need to right, right. start like, watching I what I eat. Mm-hmm. And, but, and, then, and then have that thought of, but I'll never look like that even if I lose weight or if I get toned. And so I think it's just so important for us to be aware of, A, what our tendencies are. Like, do you feel better when you're looking at, at magazines? Do you feel better when you're scrolling through social media? And to to put limits on it. And, you know, when you look at women's magazines, a lot of them are just bombarded with information about how you're not good enough. A lot of advertisements for women are really focused on, you know, if you buy my product, then you'll finally be enough. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I think that it just becomes so easy for us to compare ourselves and that we, that message definitely trickles down to kids, whether you are outwardly saying somebody else is a better parent than you are or somebody else is um, you know healthier happier than you are or your kids pick up on it just because you think that way if you're self-conscious about how you look what clothes you're wearing um, how other people are going to perceive you and kids know they figure out it's because you're comparing yourself and thinking you don't measure up Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely and I heard you even when you were talking about it just here and now where you're like they're they're smarter they're better they're prettier that you talk about that er at the end of each word and and how that just you know that really kills us in terms of our comparisons and and how we feel that that the emotion that comes about it we know that there's tons of studies out there now that say that when girls and women look at photos of other women, if they look at MTV videos from the past, or they look at uh, advertisements that they feel worse. And yet we invest so much time during the day doing those very things. We're on social media scrolling and we are comparing, comparing. So I'm imagining that putting a limit on it can certainly assist us, but also just being aware that it's happening right now. I need to shut this down. Right. And studies will show, too, if we look at other people as uh, opinion holders rather than competitors, mm. then we can, we can actually learn from them. So if somebody else uh, does have a more prestigious job than you, maybe that's a fact. But rather than thinking that you're in direct competition with that other person, just think maybe that person has information that could help me. Mm-hmm. So if you befriend people, talk to them, learn from them, and you look at it more like a learning opportunity rather than um, – a chance to to put yourself down and a reason to think you're not good enough, but to instead just be, okay, how can I learn from this individual? Then you aren't necessarily going to feel as bad about yourself. Instead, you might actually feel a little bit more inspired about changes you want to make. So important. And I I think what you're saying is, is just makes a lot of sense to all of us because so much of the time we do this. I know that you also say that mentally strong women don't see vulnerability as a weakness. And anybody who knows about Brene Brown and her focus on vulnerability, she does such good work. Uh, We know that vulnerability is an area that we need to embrace, but so often we don't. We need to be strong. We need to put on a strong persona. So what is the cost of seeing vulnerability as a weakness and what should we be doing instead? I like see so many people who, you know, they have the wall up and they feel like they need to, to look like they're perfect because, of course, letting somebody in means maybe they will judge you. Maybe they won't like you. Maybe when you put yourself out there, maybe you'll get rejected or criticized. All of those things are scary. But, of course, the cost is it's you can't really be your authentic self. You can't form true, healthy relationships with people if you aren't willing to be vulnerable. And you can't reach your greatest potential. You know, I think there's that. Um, misconception that acting tough is the same as being strong Mm -hmm. and that acting is though nothing ever hurts you that you don't have any problems and that you don't need any help is all about just trying to put on the persona that you're tough Mm -hmm. but of course being strong you need to ask for help you need to admit that you don't have all the answers and it's okay to to put your guard down and, and ask for help but 
that's tough to do. And that's tough to do because it requires a fair amount of mental strength. You have to be a strong person to say, gosh, I can't do this because it's humbling mm-hmm. to do that. But it's so important if you want to if you form true, deep connections with people and you want to reach your greatest potential, you have to do it. I, I feel what you're saying. And, you know, you say, women, including myself at times, you, you feel like almost like you're going to break in half just by trying to do it yourself. And when you finally do share with other people that you're having a tough time, that that is actually when we make the progress um and and it also it's it's an, one of those interesting things that it helps you but it also really does help the other person at the same time i i remember when i had posted something on facebook years ago that my kids were like jumping on the couch naked you know and they were just <laughs> all over the place that day and uh one of my colleagues and friends, Melissa Wardy, said, like wrote in and she was like, thank goodness this is happening at your house too, you know, because if it's happening at your house as a child development specialist, then I do not feel so bad. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> it, it, it does not make it so I don't have the same issues as everybody else just because I'm a child development specialist. Like this is happening. It is frustrating just like anybody else. Like I lose it sometimes. I, you know, just ask myself why this is happening. And especially, you know, having the knowledge I'm like this shouldn't be happening right so we put extra pressure on ourselves so being vulnerable and admitting it it's like this two-way help it helps you because you're getting the support but it's helping the other person because they're like oh I'm not so alone Right. And I think especially in today's social media age, it's so easy to just put up those pictures of happy and, um, you know, how Mm. how great your life is. And similarly, I had a friend the other day who said, you know, I just had professional family photos taken and I was going to sit down and put those photos up because I look really cute in them. She said, but then it dawned on me that, you know, I that's not necessarily real life. That was just something that happened yesterday. It was a professional photographer photographer that came in and took those pictures this is real life and she showed a picture of her dustpan filled with dirt she said I just sweeped the floor for the first time in a week and this is what's on my floor and she said that's real life and the comments that she got from people who were just like oh hallelujah uh, I can relate to that and you know and I think it's fine to post the happy photos and the and the photos that are professionally done and the ones where you look great but I think it's also important to know that uh, sometimes people will be more impressed with you and they'll want to be friends with you and they can relate to you when you also post the the not so happy moments too. Yes, absolutely. I agree with that. So in your chapter about self-doubt and how mentally strong women don't allow self-doubt to get in the way of reaching their goals, I was immediately reminded of the extensive research done on girls and boys and how they regard their own brilliance at young age. And you wound up putting that research in the book. I'm like, yes. So we know at age around five years old, both boys and girls associate their own brilliance with their own gender. As girls are the smartest, boys are the smartest. But as girls age, they seem to equate brilliance to men as well as boys do. Boys also equate it to men. And they may look at the success of girls with more of a lens of hard work. And uh, that that's why they're so successful. So How can we help our girls, and there's nothing wrong with hard work, of course, but how can we help our girls, ourselves, and the women in our lives, whether we're men or women, to ensure that self-doubt doesn't get in the way of goals? I think part of it is just looking at Uh, we need examples of women, of strong women who have done wonderful things. We know that when kids go to school, they see men, men who are presidents and men who are, uh, you know, scientists and doing wonderful things in the world. And so I think it's just sometimes helpful to just remember that women have done some incredible things too. You might have to go digging more for those stories, Mm -hmm. but to, to teach our kids that, that there are plenty of women out there doing wonderful things and to know that, uh, Self-doubt isn't necessarily a bad thing. When men tend to experience a little self-doubt, they are like, well, whatever, I'm just going to go for it anyway. When women experience self-doubt, we're more likely to think, I can't do this because I'm not completely confident. Mm -hmm. 
And, and to know that you can actually a little bit of self-doubt helps you perform better. If you had a little bit of doubt about how you're going to do on a test, mm-hmm. chances are you'll study harder. Mm-hmm. You'll put more effort into it. And so to know that you don't always have to, to be confident, you don't have to feel confident, but that sometimes the trick is to act like the person you want to become. So you say, how would a confident person act? And then take the action. And that that's how you build confidence over time is by getting out there, doing new things, by learning. And the confidence comes later. So to know you don't need to have all the answers up front to get started, just take the plunge. Mm, I, I think that is such good advice. And the idea of acting confident before you are confident, I love that part of your book, because you're talking about how the behavior can be first before the sort of mental switch that you have to do. And, and it gives us such, you know, something to do, right? You don't have to wait around until you feel confident, which may or may not come, that the behavior itself can feed the thoughts, Um, these things all work together in building mental strength. Yes, and it's so tempting though to think I can't can't do this until I feel more confident and you look around and you think everybody else is confident. But truth is a lot of other people are struggling with the same self-doubt you are, Mm -hmm. they're just taking the plunge. So to know, okay, I can move forward anyway and the confidence might come later, but I guarantee it won't come to you as a stroke of inspiration when you're just sitting on the couch waiting for it to happen. Mm, Let's just let that sink in. There's a (laughs) really important message right there. Okay, so you talk about how mentally strong women don't allow others to limit their potential. This, again, it kind of goes back to the comparisons and the perfectionism, but it also is a lot of what has been told to us over periods of time. So tell us about how our well-meaning families and teachers and coaches can limit our abilities to dream big at times and what we should do if these voices become really strong in our ears or have even been integrated in the way we actually think. Sometimes it's about sort of the the stereotypes of society that girls become the nurses and boys become the doctors. And I give some stories in the book about how ingrained that is in us, that that girls um, shouldn't be the doctor, that girls are more likely to be in the nurses. And same with, you know, in any workplace that the men are the bosses and the women are the receptionists. So I think just those subtle ways that, that kids learn about what they're going to be when they grow up get ingrained in us at a young age and even though your mother might have said to you you can be anything you want when you grow up if you only went to male doctors and you only saw women as receptionists that's still gonna strike a chord in you of well can I actually be anything I want and you know there's so many other ways that I think women allow others to limit their potential when it comes to rejection men are more likely to if they get rejected by somebody, they're more likely to bounce back and try again. Women are more likely to stop in their tracks and think, well, maybe this wasn't, I wasn't meant to do this. And there's studies on the way that women internalize criticism differently than men. When a man's criticized, he's more likely to take it at face value. Well, that's criticism. And sometimes he's able to say, well, my boss is an idiot, not that I'm an idiot. Whereas women, on the other hand, tend to treat rejection and criticism as almost the exact same thing. That when we get criticized, we feel as if we've been rejected. And it's not to say that men are right and women are wrong. I think there's a lot of um, men out there who could benefit from being a little more sensitive to criticism and and adapting to to making change. Mm -hmm. But I think for women to just be aware of that, that uh, sometimes we tend to Um, use criticism in a way that makes us think differently about ourselves. We draw conclusions. We think, well, somebody said I wasn't good, then it means I'm I'm a bad person, um, that I can't ever succeed at my job. And I think it's really about figuring out how do you change the the stories that you tell yourself. So for example, sometimes we get labeled when we're kids and sometimes they're even positive labels like you're such a a great athlete Mm. or you're really good in math. And then we grow up and it's hard to sort of outlive those labels or Mm -hmm. to expand ourselves beyond them. And we think, well, I'm I'm not supposed to be smart because I was an athlete Mm -hmm. or, or if I'm really good in math, maybe I'm not good at spelling. Mm -hmm. But, and I worked with a woman one time who her dad used to say half jokingly to her, it's a really good thing. You're pretty Mm -hmm. honey because nobody's ever going to like you for your brains. Mm -hmm. 
And she said, you know, growing up, then she just sort of took the assumption that she wasn't very smart and she put all of her energy into her appearance mm. and it created lots of lifelong problems for her. Mm. So I think it's just important to be aware of the labels, the the stereotypes that we hold, the way that we view ourselves and as adults to figure out how do you how do you change some of those core beliefs and how do you mm. be in control of the dialogue that you have in your head? You can't control what other people say or how they treat you, but you can control how you talk to yourself. And so sometimes it's just about making a mental shift of the conversations you're going to have with yourself to treat yourself with more self-compassion. Mm. Yes, when I'm speaking, one of the main presentations I do is on defining your I am. And some of those I ams are so ingrained uh, regarding negative things. I am stupid or I am an athlete. And then they can't sort of get out of that box. And I ask them whose voice that is. And it takes some digging. But when they do some digging and realize that that voice may not be from them, but it actually could be from somebody else. And they kind of otherize that voice. They can start to take ownership of defining themselves. And I, so I really, that I'm struck by what you're saying in making sure that we take back our own identity and realize that somebody's idea of who you are or who you're supposed to be doesn't mean that that is who you are to become. You decide on who you are to become. So love that complete idea. And it really resonates with me. I like the way you worded that, though, the I am and fill in the blank. I think that's really quite powerful. Thank you. Yeah, I tell people it's like you're wearing it like like a cape, like it's your thing, you know, and and sometimes we just need to break that down and, and say, well, if we were really to define ourselves and go into our own core and really think, how do I want to be defined? But also, who do I authentically feel I am? That, that it can be a really powerful change. And uh, realizing that how you've been defining yourself may not be how you define yourself at all. It's actually could be somebody else. It just fits in so nicely with what you're saying. And I think you know, it's important, especially when we're talking about those well-meaning families or like, you're an athlete, like you're so good. I think that's like a nice, no, it's a nice thing to say, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. So um, I'd love to talk a little bit about scripting. Um, and specifically, I love the whole idea of this separating fact from fiction that you're talking about, sort of the stories that you're telling yourself, especially in the chapter on not blaming ourselves when things go wrong. Uh, you talk about that in there. Uh, you talk about asking questions like, do I blame my behavior or my character? So important. And what's the percentage of responsibility that I bear? So I would love to find out, like, so let's say that a girl in your life or a woman in your life who's important to you, you find themselves, the, you find them like blaming themselves often for things that are happening. And on the one hand, of course, we want our kids, our girls, anybody to be accountable for their behavior. But what are some strategies that help us to sort of change this old story to the new story and allow us to talk through with somebody how they can take responsibility without going down a spiral of blame and shame? Yeah, I think that's really important because so many uh, girls and women, you know, if you've ever met somebody who maybe apologizes for everything, mm. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and it might even be, you know, that I showed up 30 seconds early, but I... <laughs> Should have been here 10 minutes late or something, you know, like just sort of ridiculous things that I think we've probably all encountered at least one woman in our lives who apologizes almost for like taking up space or being alive, mm -hmm. that they just are profusely apologizing. And, and I think sometimes we see girls who do this too. They take on so much blame of, you know, it's all my fault because the team, team lost and it's because I missed that one basket. So I think it's really important when we encounter people in our, the close friends, family members, kids that we really want to help with this problem that sometimes it makes sense to just kind of turn the tables on them and say, if your friend said that, what would you say to your friend? Mm -hmm. So if you say you have a 10 year old who says it's, it's my fault. The team lost because I missed the basket. You say, well, what would your, what would you say to somebody else on your team? If she said that and she might say, well, I'd say it probably wasn't all her fault because we all missed baskets. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Well, what if you gave yourself that advice? Mm -hmm. And, 
And I think that we can all make a lot of progress that way. And sometimes it's about asking them too, like what percentage of that is your fault? Let's say you missed a basket in a game. Well, how many people took baskets? Maybe there were 50 shots taken and you missed one. So then what what percentage of of the Mm -hmm. loss is actually your fault? So sometimes it's about helping other people separate fact from fiction, really looking at the at the issue, writing things down, I think can help us be less emotional and more rational about things. So if you have a friend that you sit down with and you say, let's write those down, then what percentage of, of this was your fault? And how might it be somebody else's responsibility too? Mm-hmm. maybe somebody's talking about their um, failed marriage? Well, you know, what, what percentage of this might be your partner's responsibility too? What kinds of things led to this? And just help people figure out how do you take on an appropriate amount of responsibility without accepting too much blame? Mm. Yes, yes. I, it's, it's, a, it's a balance because of course we don't want to be like, it's, you know, there's nothing that you need to take responsibility for and that it's everybody else's fault. Of course we don't want to do that. But we're talking about when somebody is then taking on all of the blame and making it so they feel like they've lent nothing to a team. They've lent nothing successful to a marriage and they are only a detriment to the situation, which I imagine from reading your book would also impact their desire to take risks. Yes. And so when you're somebody that thinks, gosh, I can't do anything right or something's all my fault, you have all this excessive guilt and blame, then it's hard because you see yourself as a bad person. And that goes back to the whole blaming your character rather than blaming your behavior, because maybe you did make a mistake. Maybe you messed up royally. But to know that that doesn't have to make you a bad person, when you start blaming your character, thinking I'm not capable of succeeding, I'm not capable of being a kind person, then you won't go forward and make life better. Uh, And I've run into tons of people in my therapy office who end up in this situation where they are blaming themselves and they sort of want to punish themselves Mm -hmm. almost Mm because they think I'm not deserving of being happy. And it just sets up this whole vicious cycle where then when they think I'm not deserving of of doing anything um, happy or I'm not deserving of taking care of myself, they sort of punish themselves and then they don't create a a positive life for themselves or for anybody else Mm -hmm. and it's really hard to get out of that cycle when you go down that road Mm -hmm. yes that question is so powerful that you provide do i blame my behavior or my character that character is fixed it's who you are it's that i am but the behavior that you've done well that's a maybe a one-time deal or yes maybe it's a habit but you still are in control of breaking that habit if it is a habit to do that behavior so I really love that question. Is it my behavior or is it my character? Because then again, you're taking it off of yourself a bit and saying, all right, there is a behavior that I did during that game. Maybe I was, you know, distracted and thinking about something else or I woke up uh, to, you know, throughout the night, I made myself crazy. I didn't get enough sleep. I ate the wrong thing and I feel really gar- like garbage right now and, and sluggish. So, you know, you, there's things that you can then change when you're blaming it on character, uh, on behavior, but there's, there, it's very fixed if it's, you know, you're only f- focusing it on character and there's nothing that you can do about it. Right. And I find that sometimes women, especially if they feel like, well, it wasn't just one mistake, maybe it was a period of their life. Maybe in college, they made some horrible choices mm-hmm. for a few years, or maybe the first few years as a parent, they weren't the best parent that they could have been for a whole host of reasons. So then they think, well, it wasn't just that I that I made one mistake, it's that I made 25 mistakes mm-hmm. or I made 800 mm-hmm. mistakes. So then they really start to internalize that it's their character. So I think it's important to know that mistakes sometimes aren't just something we make once, sometimes we make them for a while, but that that doesn't have to be who we are. It can just be what we did. Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh, I like that one. It's not who you are. It might be just what you did. Let's take that in and put high beams on that one because it's it's really important. Again, we're taking off that I am cape and saying, yes, I may have made mistakes, but it's not who I am. Love it, love it, love it. Why don't you give us your top tip, the, the top thing that we should be considering as women, as mothers, as girls, and as people who love women, who love girls, and who work with girls and women. What is, what is your top tip for what mentally strong women shouldn't do or should do? 
I think the simplest but one of the most powerful ones is to just pay attention to the way that you deal with compliments. We know that most women struggle to deal with a compliment because we want to be humble or we don't want to sound like we're bragging. When somebody says something to you, whether it's, hey, those are that's a great outfit you have on, or they say you did a really good job in that meeting last week, just try saying thank you. <laughs> just give it a whirl. It can be so uncomfortable because we know that we tend to, to do things like we downplay it. We say, oh, this dress, it only cost $10. Or we say, oh, that meeting, that was nothing. But And we downplay our success so much, or we tend to turn it around and say, no, you're great, because we're uncomfortable with somebody giving us a compliment. And so sometimes that's just the simplest way that you can just start building mental strength and showing other people that it's okay to to love yourself and to be confident. Somebody gives you a compliment, just simply say, thank you. Such an important thing. I actually was talking about it yesterday. I mean, women are classic, not only to just (laughs) not take the compliment, but to to like deflect it. Like, okay, (laughs) you know, oh, um, no, no, your your outfit is nice. <laughs> you, know, you can't even, you, can, you have to get this off of me. Like, it's immediately get this off of me. Um, and we were also talking about, <laughs> when I was on the Today Show, there was a, one of the segments I did was literally on women not being able to take compliments. And it was a, a segment that I did with Hoda and Kathy Lee. And so we're sitting there and they, and Hoda says, okay, so if... I gave you a compliment, like I was wearing my red glasses at the time. She's like, what if I said, I really like your glasses? Like, what can I say? And and what could you say? And I said, well, obviously you can quite simply say thank you, just like you were. But that you can also, sure, you can add on to that. You can say, um, thank you. I really like the color red. And oh my gosh, you should have seen her reaction. She was like, oh no, that's too much. That makes, that makes it sound like you are like too too into yourself. And I was like, real like we're there. We can't even declare that we like the color because it may seem like we are too full of ourselves, and that we couldn't even stomach that that statement. Not I even not I like them too, or I like the way they look on. Not even a compliment for ourselves, just like a, a fact. So. It really, it really strikes me when you're talking about compliments because I think we stink at them. Like, I think that yes. we really, like, it is an area that we need to work on. And, I, you know, I, 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 I so appreciate what Hoda was saying there because it really illustrates the point that we, we're, we really have trouble in this area. I think, yeah, I think that's a great example. But just by saying that you like the color red, that's, it's a, you know, it would almost be offensive or that somebody else is going to think, oh, my gosh, she's such a, a braggart. She said she liked the color red, right? But I think that's a wonderful example of sort of the extremes that we've come to. And as women, the pressure that we feel to always be saying to somebody else, no, you're better than I am. And but that you don't have to downplay your success. It's OK to just say thank you. Yes, yes. You can just simply say thank you. And, you know, it's so funny when sometimes when people say thank you, they're like they are they're almost embarrassed to say it. Um, but, you know, like they say it so sheepish, like sheepishly. But I think it's a, I think it's important that we em- embrace what we're good at. Um, I really appreciate it. Before we even started this uh, this podcast interview, you, you said to me that you really love the way that I interview. And it's it's so appreciated. It's something that, you know, I spend a lot of time doing. And and I, I want you to know, like, that compliment means a lot to me. And that's part of taking a compliment is, is acknowledging that somebody else is sharing something that's authentic to them. And that by taking the compliment, you're actually doing something kind, right? You're not like, you, you don't make the other person feel like they're lying or saying something just to say something. Like, it's it's important to take a compliment for both people. Absolutely. If I had said, gosh, I love the way you interview and you've said, oh, you know, it's nothing. I just do this every day and moved on. You know, I I sort of feel slighted by that. So I think it is great when you can acknowledge. I appreciate that you said that. Yeah, I do. I do appreciate you say that. It really is important. And I I love that. So give us the resource of the week. Uh, Where can we go to get more information about you and your fabulous new book and your previous books as well? 
my website is the best place, which is Amy Morin, LCSW, is in licensedclinicalsocialworker.com. Mm, thank you so much for that. And I just want to thank you for being on the show again today. I, I think your insights and strategies are so dead on. You clearly know your stuff so very well. And I wouldn't even be able to pick one thing that you said that I loved, but I think that all of these very structured things that we don't, we should not be doing because um, it's hurting us these and that we can change what we're doing and become more mentally strong that you said at, in previous interviews with me that mental strength is a muscle and it's something that you can keep working on that it, it applies then and it, and it applies now that as women, as girls, we can exercise this taking a compliment. We can exercise not feeling all that self-doubt. We can exercise, you know, not blaming ourselves and get better and better with uh, with all of that as time goes on. Absolutely. And I hope that uh, women and, and daughters and that men too take that from the book that we can all figure out what are my worst habits? How do I get rid of my worst habits? Because sometimes you're only as good as your worst habit. If you get rid of a, one or two bad habits, it makes your good habits so much more effective. Mm. And you really do in the book give such specific strategies. So I encourage people to take a look at that book. Um, Amy is an international bestseller. So it does, would not surprise me if this does the same thing. It really does speak speak to so many people, including myself. And I I would just encourage you to take a look and and not only just take a look, but really um, start practicing some of these mental strength exercises. Uh, It'll be a great service to you. And as we know, as adults, um, everything that we do gets absorbed by the people who look at us, watch us, and are guided by us, whether it's our own children or others. So, you know, know that everything that you're doing is going to impact others. And when we make those positive changes, it will help. So thank you so much, Amy, for being on the show today. And I hope we can do this again real soon. I hope so too. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Well, I've got my takeaways and sweet friends. I know you have yours. Let's discuss them. Come up on Facebook, go to the Dr. Robin Silverman page, or let's chat about it at drrobinsilverman.com or twitter.com slash drrobin. And I'm also on Instagram. So is Amy. We're going to be going back and forth on all of this. I'm going to be creating memes, as I always do, so that we can share some of these amazing quotes from Amy. I, you can hear me uh, throughout the interview going, oh, yes, that's a good one. Yes, absolutely. You'll hear those again. Uh, and if you love this podcast like I did, I hope you'll go up to iTunes and rate and review it so other people can hear about the podcast and know that these are strategies that we should be using and we can use and that are really helpful. I truly appreciate it. That's all the time we have for today. My fellow parents, leaders, and educators, thank you so very much for tuning in to How to Talk to Kids About Anything. For more information on books, articles, speaking engagements, or curriculum, please visit drrobinsilverman.com. There's a great podcast up there, and the show notes to this podcast will be up there as well. I look forward to weathering the storms and enjoying the sunny side of life together. And please remember, even on the days when you fall short, you've got this. You're here. You're getting the information you need. You probably heard things all today going, oh, yes, that's when I do. Oh, no, I've got to get better at that. That's okay. Let's not shame ourselves. Let's just move forward. Parenting is the ultimate do-over. I see you. I'm right there with you. And as there are moments when we doubt our know-how, our choices, and our sweet sanity, please know you are 10 times the parent you think you are. Until next time, this is Dr. Robin Silverman with How to Talk to Kids About Anything. Please tune in again and keep connecting through conversation. See you next week. You've been listening to How to Talk to Kids About Anything with Dr. Robin Silverman. For more information on books, articles, speaking engagements, or curriculum, please visit drrobinsilverman.com.